<laughs> problem with shyam is that he is always so aggressive but nonetheless i grant him that because it's a matter of few more weeks now <laughs> you know sir dr sanjeev is retiring in end of april so we have granted him that prerogative of uh, saying whatever he wants to say shyam is aggressive so 8 o'clock sessions are good we want aggressive people there 8 o'clock 8 to 9 still is on sir no no i know i know they on they teaching on webinars currently it's webinar for last one year also and people like you are there the uh, this 8 o'clock classes will be really good and the clinical presentation i'm sure will hello. be excellent hello so we are almost not... ready to start in another minute we'll be starting uh, arun do you have any last minute instructions we're going to start very soon what's the program uh, like nothing, you can tell me nothing sir Uh, best so of luck to everyone. The program is that, sir. Briefly, we will have Dr. Prabhakar make an introduction mm -hmm. uh, to the program. That will be followed by Dr. Reddy a uh, couple of minutes, and then uh, we're going to ask you to speak for a couple of minutes, yes. and then we just get started, sir. Okay. But what's the program? Are you presenting just one case? Ah, uh, uh, yes, sir. Just one case. Sir. That's the only case. And that's the only case. Uh, uh, and Dr. Bhupati and Dr. Manoj uh, from Chennai. I have done a tremendous job in actually. Yes, yes, I can see that. Putting together this whole thing, and we're keeping it a mystery. The mm. diagnosis is not being revealed. Yes. Uh, this is going to be unraveled by Dr. Kothari and others. Good, good. Eventually, good. and uh, I think there will be some more case presentations by Dr. Mathur and uh, Sanjeev. Yes, uh, they will discuss and they give their final comments in the end. Mm -hmm. on the diagnosis and then they will present a few more cases that's a bit flexible because we are doing it for the first time we are a little uncertain about the time but if it goes well we can extend it i think that's okay right. prabhakar i think you should start we have 75 people joined 75 oh good actually 400 have registered so we expect this to grow or go up 400 huh Prabhakar, can you start? It's six thirty. Unmute yourself, Prabhakar. Has no ready joined? No. Uh, anyway, so let me uh, start off uh, uh, by saying uh, warm good morning, uh, good evening to everyone. But we get used to this good morning, good evening business because you kind of do it uh, between US and India and other countries. So right now it's only India. So good evening to everyone. So, on behalf of the Centre for Digital Health at the Public Health Foundation of India, uh, the program chairs, members of various committees, and all my colleagues, it's a pleasure and privilege to invite you uh, to the inaugural masterclass in cardiology. This innovative program has been put together by an eminent panel of cardiology teachers across the country, who are well known to all of you, um, and I'm thankful to all of them in making this happen. One may wonder as to why we need another masterclass. there are several master classes to help students approach their exams i think for us the broad aim is to improve healthcare for indians at all levels of care and every level of healthcare provider has a role in this for this we need three c's content knowledge good clinical skills and care that is patient centered in addition there is need for connectedness connectedness with all levels of care so i'm not going to talk about content because all indian medical students are good in acquiring knowledge of ex of extraordinary degree for example when i was a medical student i would know 20 causes of aortic regurgitation but i really think all that is useless you have to work on the 80 20 principle and um uh, a 20% knowledge acquire other skill by which you can provide uh, good care and these include avoiding cognitive errors our own personal biases Uh, diagnosing patients on a single sign or uh, test and sticking to it we have failed many times because of this and what matters is the evidence based pattern recognition and of course a strong intuition which is not abstract but acquired we will discuss all these during the course and the course will have two programs every alternate four, fortnight we will have a clinical grand round in the nejm format so that we utilize all available information on our journey towards becoming excellent clinicians in the alternate fortnight we will have structured journal reviews so that we learn how to analyze and interpret them and apply to our day to day practice so that we become curious at practical researches both these i believe will enable us to become well rounded cardiologists 
we also will have one full day of exam case discussion within the six month span and also in order to help first year students to develop the thesis proposal, we'll conduct a half day course on how to develop a research proposal. In addition, the proceedings are likely to be published in the National Medical Journal of India. Dr. Piyush Sani has kindly agreed to attend and uh, see this program and consider this. So finally, despite our best efforts, there will be glitches. In order to learn from our mistakes, we have an academic oversight committee who will provide feedback on each session and make this program a dynamic and living one. Please feel free to write to the academic advisory committee or to Dr. Krishna Kumar and me who are partners in this crime and we will take cognizance of all your suggestions and concerns. After all, they say the work stops with us. Finally, there's a long list of people who I need to thank, but we'll ask Dr. Krishna Kumar to do that. But I would like to mention my colleagues, Dr. Arun Jos, Priyanka Gupta, uh, Shruti Vahal, Anshika Sharma, Vishnu Nair, and several others who worked tirelessly to get this program running. With this, let, let me once again welcome you all to this academic piece and hand over to Professor Eddy to say a few words. Thank you very much, Dr. Prabhakaran and uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar for uh, convening this very, very important platform uh, for knowledge sharing and knowledge enhancement. Uh, I believe this is going to serve a very useful purpose in terms of providing both in-depth knowledge of cardiology, but also in terms of interpretation of research methodology and research evidence, which can be applied gainfully even to interpret the various publications that come out with such great frequency in the area of cardiology, but also to develop research skills to design, conduct and evaluate people's own research. It is very clear that uh, cardiovascular diseases are the number one contributor both to mortality and to disability in India at the moment. And these are going to rise further in terms of burden as we move along. And therefore, enhancing the knowledge of competent and conscientious cardiologists to recognize and appropriately manage these conditions is going to be very important. I would also like to emphasize that cardiology, while it has to be developed in terms of knowledge and skills as a specialty at the tertiary care level, has to be fully integrated with other levels of care if it has to really advance the health system's competence overall. Uh, therefore, I would urge you, even while developing these competencies, which are very much necessary, particularly to meet some of the challenges that we are going to face as a country with the rising burden of cardiovascular disease, to also examine how the competencies can actually be reflected in improving the quality of diagnosis and care at secondary and primary care levels, uh, whether on initial evaluation or on follow-up uh, after return from tertiary care. So I think that integration with the health system is going to be absolutely uh, necessary. And therefore, uh, we, I believe apart from having the health system sensitivity, which you have very well pointed out, it's also important to develop a good insight into research methodology in order to interpret evidence for appropriate application uh, in one's own practice, whichever the level of practice. And there it is essential uh, that uh, the articles that you have proposed for discussion at the journal club or even in terms of case discussion, in terms of the contextual application of acquired knowledge, uh, they become very, very important. And it is critical that the context becomes also the backdrop against which this knowledge is interpreted and applied. Uh, therefore, I believe uh, the research methodology becoming an essential component of this exercise, not as a dry didactic exercise, but as an exciting way of looking at evidence and looking immediately for appropriate applications in one's own practice area and teaching area. I think that is going to be an important element uh, that we ought to really look at. And I believe by enhancing this competence, we'll actually be able to provide India a platform overall 
for conducting the kind of high quality, large trials and other studies that required even in the diagnostic area, for example, which are appropriate to our context, our patient population, but nevertheless can generate knowledge which can inform and also influence other countries. Uh, just to give you an example, when the GC trials were conducted in Italy, uh, the various series of GC trials, people sat up and wondered how the Italians could put together uh, so many hospitals across Italy to generate trials of such high quality. In fact, the Britishers started wondering how could the Italians actually do it? And that too with practicing hospitals, not with a few select academic centers. And now we recognize whether it is recovery or solidarity or whichever large scale, simple randomized trials are absolutely essential for generating very good quality evidence for answering some very important questions rather than just a few niche attempts at research in very small select groups which do not necessarily produce the kind of results that will influence policy and practice. So I believe apart from providing an exciting platform for education and enhancing the knowledge of research methodology, you also ought to look at the dimensions of how you're going to integrate the health system from primary to tertiary care and en ensure that cardiology is provided with competence and care, appropriate care at all levels. At the same time, advanced knowledge. Charles Mayo, the founder of Mayo Clinic said, the principal objectives of medical education are to cure patients and to advance science. We may not be able to cure everybody, but we should provide the appropriate care. But we also need to advance science. And for that, I think a regular discussion of various clinical cases, but also some of the issues related to health systems as where these cases and patients are positioned is going to be very helpful for advancing our knowledge, especially in the area of implementation research and health systems research. So I thank again for this initiative, Dr. Prabhakaran and Dr. Krishna Kumar. Thank Professor Manchanda for continuing to be providing uh, the guiding uh, angel for our, all our efforts and the whole community of uh, cardiologists, present and future, who are part of this very exciting initiative and wish you all the best. Unfortunately, I'm pre-committed to another meeting and I will have to excuse myself at this point in time, but uh, I would like to bring my very best wishes for the success of this inaugural initiative and many more to follow. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you, sir, for um, that... Um, inspiring introduction. Uh, may I request Dr. Manchanda to say a few words now? Well, uh, friends, it's an honor to chair the first uh, clinical grand round session of master class of uh, Public Health Foundation of India. I would also like to compliment uh, Dr. Prabhakar and uh, KK and others for this uh, uh, excellent initiative. I think this is going to improve our uh, training of the uh, uh, budding cardiologists quite a lot. See, I have been a teacher for the last 50 years. I have been an examiner also in almost all the universities of the country. What I found was that uh, there is really a dearth of uh, academic institutions that Prabhakar said who are really interested in excellence in training. There's been too much emphasis on interventions. As you know, when I take the viva of the students, they know a lot about uh, interventions, but they are very poor in basics. So I think uh, this masterclass is uh, going to produce to balanced uh, cardiologists. And I hope that uh, some of the cardiologists will leave intervention and maybe go into clinical and preventive cardiology. Because as uh, Srinath Reddy said, the ultimate uh, uh, method of uh, managing heart disease uh, anywhere in the world is prevention and, and there are very few people who are really interested in preventive cardiology. I have been asking a large number of uh, uh, students what do you want to become and they say intervention and I ask them why they say 
it's the money. So I think we have to really uh, take this mind off uh, uh, the young cardiologists from this and go to academics. I remember our role models used to be Dr. Suja Roy, who had no car. He used to walk down to his office every day and uh, he had no house of his own. And we wanted, we wanted to be like Dr. Roy. But now the role models of the modern cardiologists are, the young people are those who have huge cars, they have an aeroplane, and uh, they live in posh bungalows. And all. So I think uh, we have to strike a balance, and I'm sure this type of masterclass will uh, make uh, thinking cardiologists. And uh, as uh, uh, Prabhakar said, the aim of this masterclass is not only to prepare them for the examination, and improve their thesis. You see, this is a great idea that you have, because I have seen that the thesis of these uh, DM students or DNB students are really of very poor quality, because they really don't uh, spend too much time on research. They're not guided properly. And I think uh, Public Health Foundation can help them quite a lot. And this will, I think, go a long way. But I think to make them into a thinking cardiologist, I call them a holistic cardiologist, because although clinical cardiology has, uh, I've been uh, uh, told to have a death knell in the Western countries. I think very important, as this case will show. And uh, uh, I think uh, Prabhakar and KK have really taken uh, in their uh, hold a large number of dedicated teachers, the best teachers. We have excellent teachers in our country, but uh, they are not able to meet at the same platform. I think the students will, for the first time, meet uh, these teachers who are really dedicated and they are uh, uh, excellent. And uh, they will be talking of the state of the art, both clinical as well as applied, as well as research to these students. And all. So I think this is going to be a very unique program. And I'm told today also there are more than 75 students have joined. It's a very, very good beginning. And uh, I would like that uh, this program becomes a little more practical. Uh, for example, you see in DM examination or DNB, we really talk of things which are not really of day-to-day you know, -day importance. Uh, many times tough cases, etc., and we don't talk of that. I hope this program will really uh, take into consideration the practice which the future cardinals are going to uh, take up. And uh, I wish all the best for this program. I congratulate once again KK and uh, Prabhakar for really choosing this excellent case. I was going through this case. It's a very, very interesting, very unique case. I have not, uh, I do not know the diagnosis. And uh, I think uh, this uh, tells the quality of the work they are going to start. I think the, uh, uh, well begun is half done. I think this case is uh, top quality. And once again, all the best. I think this uh, program is very, very promising. I would have all my uh, blessings and the help to you, whatever I can, whatever my experiences, but I'm sure the type of group you have, this program is going to have uh, a very bright future, and I'm sure we will have better cardiologists than uh, what we have been producing. That way. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, real kind words and uh, uh, words of wisdom. Um, can I request KK now to um, introduce the course and thank everybody uh, who has been involved in the program. Thank you, Prabhakar. Uh, without much ado, of course, I have to uh, once again thank Dr. Manchanda. He's been a guiding light and he was our teacher when we were DM students and we can never forget the interactions that we've had. And he laid the foundations of critical thinking. So we have today an extraordinary group of people. Uh, the case in itself will be moderated by uh, arguably the, one of the finest teachers of the country today, Dr. Kothari. Um, everybody is in reverence of his uh, extraordinary uh, intellect. And uh, not just that, it's, uh, it's his approach that is very inspiring. And I almost every few days consult him on a difficult case. He is my go-to person for the challenging case is not just in cardiology, but pediatric or adult cardiology, sometimes even internal medicine. So we have the finest person to, to moderate the show. Uh, what then we have is uh, the case in itself has been prepared by uh, Dr. Uh, Nagendra Bhupati, who actually 
guided us to Dr. Manoj. Dr. Manoj is in Kaveri Hospital uh, in Chennai. And Dr. when we announced this program, Dr. Bhupati said, listen, I, I've come across something very special. Uh, this case has been worked, has been, I, I came to know about this case with uh, Dr. Manoj, and this is something that we should consider presenting. So once that was done, we had to identify a student. Dr. Bhupati was again kind enough to suggest one of his students, Dr. Palgun, who will be presenting the case. We thought we should have a group of students who would be a part of this panel. So we've decided to choose three students from three institutions. So we have a student from Chitra, from All India Institute, and from Jayadeva. From Chitra, we have Karthik. From All India Institute, we have Pavan Teja. And from Jayadeva, we have Dr. Sri Ranga. These are student panelists who would also participate in the process and would be invited to interact at various points. We also have two expert faculty uh, in this. Uh, we have Dr. Srinivas, who is the professor of cardiology at Jayadeva, whom I have known for many, many years as an extraordinary clinician and, and, and a very versatile clinician, very balanced, and someone whom we respect immensely out there. I also hear, have, along with him, Dr. Sarita Shekhar, one of my colleagues, who is one of the finest doctors uh, I've known, very caring physician, and uh, somebody that I thought we should look to nurture the next generation. She is the next generation. So she will also be part of the expert faculty. So this is the group that is going to be discussing the case. And once the case is discussed, we have two extraordinary experts. We have Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, who has been a teacher for so many generations of cardiologists at All India Institute, who taught us how to interpret uh, imaging, who taught us the approach to imaging. And I still think of him almost every day when I look at images, uh, angiograms, CT, everything. So a cardio cardiac radiologist of great eminence. He's going to be be interpreting the last part of the show as well as provide us with some interesting related examples. Atul Mathur is another cardiologist I deeply respect. He's famous for being couple days cardiologist, and uh, but that's not uh, his claim to flame. Uh, he is an extremely balanced clinician, and I, I deeply respect him. So we wanted him as a part of the family. So this is the group today. We have an exceptional group. And we have tremendous participation from the audience. We have a very, uh, very, very respected academic oversight com committee that is constituted by Dr. Aditya Kapoor from SGPGI, Dr. Ajay Dahel, Dr. Uh, Natrajan from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Santosh Satish, Dr. K. Venugopal. They are all going to look at the program and offer their critical comments. So with that, we should begin. Uh, over to Dr. Uh, Palgun, who will present the case. But if you want, Dr. Kotari, can you just say a few words as we can ask Dr. Palgun to start? Just, just yeah. before Dr. Kotari comes on, uh, uh, KK, I think uh, I will fail in my duty uh, if we don't uh, thank uh, some pharmaceuticals who have actually provided uh, unrestricted educational grant to uh, do this program. And thanks to them. And thanks to all the people. Many of the faculty are there in the attendees. I just would like to tell them that they will appear on the panel as we uh, go along in the subsequent uh, case discussions, because if, if we have everybody on the panel, then it becomes very cluttered. So this is just a mechanism of uh, keeping things under control. So I warmly welcome all the faculty who are there among the attendees, and uh, thank you for all for joining. So hand over to Dr. Kotari. Well, good evening to all. Uh... I'm grateful to Dr. Prabhakar and Dr. Krishna Kumar. You, you can see how fantastic idea is this and what a, you know, when they do something, they do it so well. It is, it's very well known. Uh, I want to just make two, three things clear. See, the, the idea of this thing as uh, articulated by both of them is, is not to pass an exam. So we will not be discussing it in exam format. Uh, how will we discuss is open. Like it is beginning, we don't exactly know how it will run. But my idea is, see, we can do it two ways. Either we can do it in a real world fashion, or we can do it like a CPC with a you know, high index of suspicion with different things. So I think I choose to do it like more of a real world situation with, with trying to punch, trying to get uh, learning uh, messages in between. So it's the experiential learning, as they say. So my idea of this session is, uh, and, and it will evolve with time, is to have an experiential learning. You, ne you may not necessarily get uh, new information, but you probably get a little different experience of learning. And that would be my way of looking at it. We have an advantage of looking at the story retro retrospectively. So that would help. 
and, and uh, we will try to you know use it for the students so in between it might be a little bit of didactic as well so with that uh, concept we will go forward and i'm again thankful to dr prabhakar dr krishna kumar for this opportunity and let's make best of use of it and i am also very happy that dr manchanda is there who has taught most of it clinical reasoning to me and we will be using those clinical reasoning my idea of a case is just clinical reasoning and nothing else so i think we will start over to the presenter dr falgun dr falgun you can unmute yourself and start yes sir i have unmuted uh, yes please go on terrific sir. and can somebody share you want to share your screen or is somebody going to show sir. your slides how is it going to work dr priyanka yeah, Yeah. Yeah. yeah fantastic so we can start uh, falgun you can show put it on slide show yeah yeah please put it on slide show yeah yeah good evening everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, the phfi uh, for providing me such a wonderful opportunity to present this uh, uh, tremendous case in front of the uh, uh, master class teachers <clears throat> yeah uh, with uh, all your permission i would like to proceed with the case uh, coming to the background of this uh, case an 82 year old uh, lady uh, who was uh, apparently well 3 uh, days ago uh, she suddenly developed uh, breathlessness maybe 9 uh, months ago she developed the sudden onset of breathlessness uh, for about 3 days initially she could able to do her routine activities uh, but she could not able to perform her routine activities after third day of this uh, symptom onset and later she came to the er for uh, further help <coughs> uh, uh, she was able to do her uh, routine activities uh, and take care of her uh, debil- uh, her disabled uh, husband uh, next slide please yeah uh, uh, she was uh, uh, known hypertensive for the past 10 years uh, for which she used to, she used to be take on uh, she used to take the pills amlodipine and atenolol and uh, without any uh, prior history of uh, diabetes mellitus or coronary artery disease uh, uh, however she had uh, some amount of uh, varicosities uh, in both the legs below the knees and uh, also she was diagnosed to have acid peptic disease uh, 10 years ago when she underwent under, uh, uh, upper ge endoscopy and uh, and for which she was uh, on routine treatment uh, she doesn't have any drug allergies or uh, any other form of allergies she underwent uh, she did, didn't undergo any uh, big surgeries except the cataract surgery with a bilateral iol implantation and uh, she is a mother of uh, four sons uh, all were uh, normal deliveries Uh, there were no uh, significant uh, 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 history in the uh, 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 there was no uh, post menopausal issues uh, next slide please uh, dr falkut you can also control the slides okay thank you oh yeah, yeah uh, uh i would have, like to ask her uh, yeah we will like to you know puncture because this is the brief history you given yes, and uh, we will in the interest of time we will talk briefly but i think i want to make a point here and yes, maybe sir. ask you a question yes sir uh, i have dr srinivas and dr sarita also with me so first thing i want to ask you is what is occam's razor sorry sir what is occam's razor you heard of a occam's razor or a law of parsimony mm and i'll come back why i'm asking this okay sir are there are uh, dr kk shall we ask the other panelists i mean is that the way you want yeah, it yeah yeah other students can also answer uh, they are would there. like to say what comes razor what to, so we are beginning so we some fundamentals thing we need to probably we talk i think so don't feel pressured if you can't answer it dr kothari is uh, law of parsimony or occam's razor is something like you try to diagnose one disease in in a patient right from various symptoms you try to reduce unnecessary pluralities so you try to connect everything in one and yes, occam's sir. razor fail when you are against an elderly the whole idea is when you have 82 year old you know that you are not having you are not necessarily having to use the occam's razor that means whatever symptoms they narrate suppose there is a history of fall it is not because of one disease she may be having three four five things that she is anemic from gi blood she is having postural hypertension she has a six sinus syndrome so therefore in elderly our approach is different i think yes. it's very relevant that when you are against 82 year old your approach is very different from when you are against a 28 year old 
and the basic difference is there are multiple morbidities so when we are looking at her symptoms that she is having breathlessness for last 3 days it is you know we will view it differently first thing first i think we will think that it's a covid in current times unless proved otherwise we would have thought of covid yes sir but you say the covid test was done and it will be negative so we'll take that out of equation for the time being now the other thing is the pace of illness that you know how, how what is it like she was worst on the day 1 or she's worst on day 3 So uh, is, she, are we against some, something evolving, or it was it has done the damage and then we are suffering like that? So from story, it seems that it has it has worsened with time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, and the other thing which comes to my mind is that it, she has lived rather well till eighties, despite us that she has not visited many doctors. She has generally been keeping very well. So there is a history of longevity, and that's a good thing. Yes. Sir. So so with that beginning, I think we will just see further how it goes. And I last for Shreema and Sarita if they want to add something here. Don't add anything, Sridhar. This is brilliant. Uh, I think, uh, considering the, all the in this background, maybe we we can just ask them to maybe for possibilities. What do you think of at uh, this stage with the, this basic presentation? Um, anybody in the back can uh, say what will be the uh, possibilities with uh, not not too many too too big a list maybe. first one two three four possibilities considering her age and the rapidity of onset of uh, symptoms and the background uh, history so causes of acute breathlessness in 82 year old sir yeah. uh, it can be it can be the lung yeah. issue it can be the heart issue yes or it can be uh, uh, it can be uh, something related to the uh, metabolic issue sir Name because of sir. some examples like a uh, uh, like respiratory acidosis no we don't so when we talk of clinical think that's what dr shinivas would also like it's not we not say respiratory acidosis we might say some pneumonia yeah. we might say yes, some uh, you know, yes, pulmonary embolism uh, broadly we can categorize into lung issue or uh, heart issue sir or anemia also sir maybe uh, we can say uh, yeah being the cardiology muscles uh, you are going to consider cardiology problems as the uh, the number one two yes, yeah then we have to keep in mind the respiratory uh, issues it could be uh, yeah, uh, considering the age and uh, probably some suggestion of some varicosity is though it's a below knee uh, mild uh, varicosity they have said so one may have to consider the respiratory possibility especially the pulmonary embolism like scenario considering the cardiac thing the background and is being an elderly lady her activity will probably be limited uh, so with that uh, um, just because the symptoms are of 3 uh, days uh, duration one uh, cannot say she was perfect till the earlier so we may have to background problem which got precipitated recently in, the, in that way we would like to think of it could be either uh, ischemic heart disease or uh, with the uh, acute coronary syndrome scenario with uh, lv dysfunction or uh, with a mechanical complication or of course at this age uh, one uh, being a hypertensive one can always keep in mind the possibility of accelerated hypertension and so on if you and of course uh, one at this age you will also have to consider the possibility of additional um, uh, arrhythmias which could be contributing uh, to the deterioration Yes, you can expand on this. On this, if you want to say something, you can uh, continue following with this Dr. background. Doctor Kotari, if you permit me, uh, there are a few suggestions from the chat box, so I thought I'll mention it to you. One of yes. the things is that it could be new onset AF, which causes this, and the other person says it is uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Yeah, perfect. I mean, that that's very likely. So we'll examine and see what what we are doing. I mean, so we have covered most of the possibilities, and we'll see. But the examination can sh shortlist this too. Go on. Yeah. The next effect is what we see generally. I mean, many of these underlying diseases they get uh, they become symptomatic due to uh, 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 the, the issues like GI bleed, which considering the history of acid peptic disease, whether uh, GI bleed history uh, is uh, there that we will have to ask the pa patient and find out because anemia is one thing that. Uh, Uh, makes a person suddenly become uh, symptomatic, especially acute GI bleed with uh, significant anemia. Sorry, it's a very common scenario that we see. Yes, sir. Do you want to ask anything? No, sir. I would be repeating the same opinion. Right, right. So we will move forward for examination. 
my for so it could uh, be could be cardiac respiratory or or general systemic or uh, amongst this cardiac is shortlisted there so let's see let's examine yes sir i'll proceed sir next slide yes sir can you move on to the next slide uh, you can go or algun you can yeah. yes sir yeah uh, coming to the examination uh, she is conscious comfortable during the time of admission i mean during the time of examination and uh, she is uh, morbidly obese with uh, uh, bmi of uh, 34.3 uh, she has no pallor uh, ictus or clubbing cyanosis uh, there was no goiter and her ankles were full bilaterally which was fitting in nature and uh, jvp was normal uh, she was febrile during the time of examination pulse was 90 per uh, 90 per minute uh, regular in rhythm and uh, volume was normal Uh, her bp was significantly elevated with a value of 220 by 100 mm mercury spo2 was normal in uh, checked in room air it was 95% distal pulses were palpable Do both the dorsal pedis were uh, palpable whereas uh, uh, posterior tibial artery was not palpable uh, coming to the systemic examination systemic examination uh, uh first start sound was normal uh, whereas uh, loud a2 was noted along with a pan systolic murmur of grade 3 by 6 uh, heard well at apex and also along uh, and, and along the left sternal border uh, coming to the respiratory system examination bilateral crepitations were found and uh, abdominal examination was uh, uh, no uh, uh, no significant abnormalities were found so you know this is this does show declining interest in physical examination because you say there is a pulse, pulse pressure of 220 by 100 with a pulse volume normal you have a 100 plus pulse pressure but the pulse volume we are saying normal we have said s2 normal without making a comment about the split and p2 lv s3 is absent which is likely or not likely now with there are there are limitation to examination in obese elderly we take that so cardiomegaly is there or not there you did not mention but we see that there is jvp is raised fine basal cracks are there and pressures are very severely elevated 220 by 100 correct yes sir yes. so one would have expected uh, i mean in in terms of you know holistic approach one would have like to say couple of things uh, what is the fundus like you know? cardiologists have given up on fundus it is true that most of us will not know anything but if you are talking in terms of a case because it will help how will that help sir uh, fundus examination in case of uh, uh, cvs case uh, uh, we have to see whether uh, there is any uh, hypertensive retinopathy changes as well as the uh, uh, not in this particular case but uh, we can uh, see the diabetic retinopathy both non proliferative and proliferative diabetic retinopathy you know, in a patient with a, who is presenting with heart failure and severe hypertension the yes, question sir. is this could be i mean she is a known hypertensive so yes. she had some hypertension on treatment and yes. now she is suddenly shot up to 200 plus yes sir so what and in that setting fundus does become important isn't it because is it are there target organ damage yes sir and that that's a important one so at this juncture could you like to just digress a little bit and say how how the treatment of hypertension have on the vision and what are the visual implication of hypertension uh we see hypertension day in day out and we don't we are not generally so much tuned to think that it is mattering to his eyes do you think hypertension can become blind what are the ways by which hypertension can become blind because of hypertension sir one is a retinopathy sir uh, in the form of papilledema and uh... no, so does papilledema cause blindness then then and there if a patient is papilledemic he comes to opd with what he doesn't complain of blindness so how does a hypertensive patient loses his vision others can other student panels sir, want to ask vitreous hemorrhage sir vitreous hemorrhage vitreous hemorrhage is not a high part of hypertensive retinopathy it can happen retinal detachment can happen because of retinal hemorrhages not vitreous hemorrhage anybody else quickly because quickly 1 2 3 i mean papilledema uh, eventually can lead lead to blindness but it will be post papilledemic optic atrophy not during papilledema okay how else how else Retinal, retinal, retinal hemorrhages. hemorrhages and what else? Retinal artery thrombosis. A known risk factor is hypertension. So retinal artery thrombosis, retinal venous. I mean retinal venous thrombosis, 
little artery embolism because of atherosclerosis post peripheral atrophy and hemorrhages and one thing which is very vital and which or which cardiologists often miss that the treatment of diabetic retinopathy in a patient with diabetic retinopathy treatment of hypertension decreases the blindness so it's very vital to treat hypertension in diabetic retinopathy patient so there are several ways we should be tuned to hypertension we should be tuned to patient as a whole when we are looking at hypertensive we have to see mindful of these things uh, and more important question i want to you ask you to understand uh, is, can you explain to me what happened why did she just shot up to 220 i mean what happens what are the common causes of the patient having a pressure of 170 180 suddenly comes with a pressure of 220 uh yes sir actually uh, we can explain like uh, the acute pulmonary edema uh, is a resultant of uh, elevated blood pressure or else uh, the pulmonary edema is causing i mean the uh, elevated blood pressure is causing the pulmonary edema uh, both ways is possible sir yeah so that means what you are saying is that sometimes for suppose somebody gets ischemia and gets pulmonary edema he will shot up his pressure so a pressure could be result of pulmonary edema and it can cause pulmonary edema also taken so one cause of severe hypertension could be a ischemia provoking pulmonary edema and then secondary causing hypertension but that's not a common cause isn't it what are the common causes of uh, suddenly shooting pressure where patient patient was taking treatment she generally okay coming to opd with hypertension and one day you find they has come with a pressure of 220 by 110 or into hypertensive urgency emergency so one Yeah, carry you on. Renal issues. Sorry. Renal renal issue is saying. Yeah, some some. So what kind of renal issues we are looking at? Acute is like renal artery thrombosis, sir. Like some. Sir. Yeah, but what is the commonest mm. thing like? Flash so pulmonary edema is more clearing. common in renal artery stenosis, sir. Bilateral renal artery stenosis are more common. So to some associate. good answers have come: stress, drug non-compliance, renal most artery stenosis. But the posterior circulation stroke. but the commonest thing is it it is a very well known and un, un, un understood thing it's it's commonly happens without our without any of these things and we we only know that somehow it is related to renin angiotensin system so when a patient gets malignant hypertension we only know that renin angiotensin is overactive how does it happen it can happen because of renal artery stenosis it can happen from various other things but interestingly it, it is not understood how does it happen for the vast majority of patients and many of them take it nicely nothing happens to them they are asymptomatic you are surprised to see pressure 220 and others are getting into malignant hypertension and you know all the target organ damage so the corollary of knowing this is that there are situation where pressures are high but they never get into hypertensive encephalopathy that means they never show malignant hypertension which are the hypertensive patients who do not show malignant hypertension typically so malignant hypertension is a hallmark of renin angiotensin overactivation situations where renin angiotensin systems are not likely to get overactivated for example primary aldosteronism coarctation of aorta these are typically two cases where you don't get into severe hypertension encephalopathy conversely where you have high renin pheochromocytoma takayasu arteritis renal artery stenosis you get into target organ damage so these things will see how we view a patient with hypertension you know ashina was please ashina was Yeah. Shall we go further? Anything you want yeah, to add? Yeah, go. Here? But I, I just uh, we can go. But I just want the students to ingest tremendous yeah. number of messages that have come across out here. Uh, quickly, Doctor Kothari talked about hypertension happening without encephalopathy and a list of causes. Looking at the fundus, very important, and blindness in the context of uh, severe hypertension. You can go on. Yeah, just just one thing, just one. Can can uh, Falgun? Can we see the pulse and tell the pressure? Just we palpate the pulse and say the blood pressure this much. Uh, can yes, can sir, the uh, hypertension be diagnosed by palpation of pulse? Sir, uh, that too in this kind of uh, like elderly patients, uh, we we may not tell it accurately, sir. Uh, due to the uh, peripheral arterial thickening, we may not assess uh, uh, the blood pressure. Now, commonly, what is the pulse like in a patient who presents with severe hypertension? Say pressure of one ninety by one hundred twenty. What is the pulse like usually? It will be like a high volume pulse, sir, because uh, the pulse pressure is uh, so high. It should be high volume. Sir. So, Falgun is, is totally incorrect. The whole problem is that we really cannot tell blood pressure by pulse pulse palpation. So many times they have because of intense vasoconstriction, the pulse may be looking very small, and there is a severe hypertension. If you have atherosclerotic chronic hypertension in elderly, you can have wide pulse pressure looking like AR, and they have basically systolic hypertension. But vast majority of severe hypertension patient pulse may not give you a clue. That's why it's a silent killer for patient as well as for doctors, because just by looking at pulse, very often you cannot tell. There is one method described that you can see: you press the brachial and see the 
pulse on the radial and see the amount of pressure required but that will be very very you know empirical by and large it's better to say that pressure is to be measured to know what is pressure yeah other things are there pseudo hypertension calcified arteries all, all that one should keep in mind but the moral of the story is that pressure is to be measured okay go ahead so you think basically is... the yeah. the history one could uh, probably in this situation should also ask about uh, whether there is any decrease in urine output whether there is any visual disturbance these are some negative histories that we should uh, elicit because again that could uh, go with uh, what we are seeing on examination and the way she has presented yes, it could be a clue towards what is going wrong absolutely sir the history is limited sir uh, like uh, uh, i would i wanted That's to okay. have i think a... i think you need to just get the message across yes sir i know uh, dr falgun didn't have did not actually physic actually take the history from the yes, he's yes, presenting yes, what is provided to him right. but nonetheless the points that dr srinivas is making needs to be taken by all the students listening in that's all yes sir thank okay you. so falgun it's not directed at you you're doing splendidly well so far I will throw some bounces at you just to give you some practice. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Doctor Kotari is known to throw googly, not bounces. So he is a. Go on. <laughs> okay. Come on, next. Uh, sir, uh, patient was managed with uh, valsartan, 80 milligrams of uh, uh, valsartan uh, twice a day, and along with amlodipine and uh, beta blocker carvedilol, uh, she required uh, oxygen uh, for about 12 hours to settle. and also patient was treated with uh, iv furosemide 40 mg in er and later uh, uh, patient was evaluated with uh, certain laboratory parameters uh, troponin i was normal and uh, significant elevation of uh, nt pro bnp and all other uh, uh, lab parameters were uh, 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 within the normal range except there is a mild elevation of esr Uh, and then uh, there is a, a mild dyslipidemia in the form of uh, ldl it is a 118 mg percent sir all others are uh, uh, optimal sir so uh, all the students panel is there so what what is happening i mean so we have a, how do you read this nt pro bnp 1900 what is your response to that so more than 75 years of age uh, the cut off for heart failure detection is 1800 picograms per ml it is elevated in this patient but marginally only isn't it marginally. if you see as you rightly pointed out if you look at without age then it looks very severely elevated but the point is that with that age it goes on so it, it is not very terribly elevated it is elevated now but in a obese patient uh, yes. it can be falsely negative low also. falsely low yeah so what are the so point is so i will ask all of you you have one option either you can look at the jvp or you can look at the bnp if you are given only one which one will you take jvp sir jvp that is indian cardiologist talking who is not actually doing nowadays so so if the patient is coming with <laughs> acute decomposited heart failure how many of them have jvp elevated because it's a common scene you know acute decomposited heart failure patient comes to our setup generally are very sick so they have but otherwise if you see the trial data only one third have jvp elevated so there is a schism between the two and it's a, it's a artificial question you should look at both but should not neither neither one of them is you know better than the other and you have to see what are the false positive pro bn people so patient is not in heart failure but has elevated bnp what are those situations sir uh, uh, cva sir like uh, any brain issues mm -hmm. so uh, elevated bnp without heart failure so renal dysfunction correct and so somebody is already saying obesity renal dysfunction obesity. Obesity will have a low. Yeah, we will have a low. Yeah, so it is giving a falsely low thing. So let us say where it is not very you know reliable. So CKD, obesity, infection, three nice things have come up, and then sometimes it's a technical one. You know? so there are several cases where heterophile antibodies are interfered. So if you have no context and BNP is raised, then you keep in mind that technical factors can be there, and we just recognize that yes, BNP is elevated. And the other thing is in hypertension itself. so patient of hypertension severe hypertension can cause bnp elevation without necessarily being in hypertensive heart failure so you know no single test is just answering everything in clinical medicine but we register that this patient seems to be having uh, diastolic heart failure with severe hypertension like what we call is heart failure with pressure rejection fraction most likely so far and the top i is not very elevated 
drop eye is not very sus suspicious so so what is your take on coronary whether it's a ischemic event or not on ischemic event maybe we'll need some more data mm -hmm. uh, i will go on after comment from shrinivas and sarita Bonds, the ECG and all is yet to come. So let's see those. Sarita, you are uh, speaking in a very low tone. Oh, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Now you are audible. Yeah. Okay, go on. Uh, coming to the ECG, sir. Uh, it is a sin. It is a sinus rhythm uh, with a rate of around uh, seventy, uh, with the one is to one conduction. With the PR interval is uh, marginally prolonged. It is uh, around 200 milliseconds, uh, and there is a T wave inversions in uh, lead three and AVF from V1 to V3 as well. With uh, only V1, V2, V3 are up. V2, V3 are okay. Yeah, V2, V3 is okay. Yeah, is... Sir, uh, sir, that one is uh, VPC, sir. Next one is this one. But that's also not inverted. It's okay. okay. It's not very much clear. Sir. Okay. okay, taken. Yes, sir. Uh, with the uh, two uh, ventricular premature complexes here and here. So why there is no LVH? Three so severe hypertensive. Uh, sir, paradoxically, it is not uh, showing any uh, 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 LVH uh, mm -hmm. as per the Sokolov line criteria. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, uh, possibly uh, we have to rule out the exact uh, lead placement also before commenting this, sir. Unlikely, uh, because limb leads are also not showing much high voltages. Yeah, yes, sir. So yeah. it's not likely that placement will change much. But yes, okay, one, we can look at the placement. So what is Karthik obesity, and Pavan saying? Obesity is there. So obesity is likely. And the also patient has the edema. So in an elder, older patient, no LVH on ECG is not at all, you know, it is rather a rule because the specificity, sensitivity of ECG for LVH is very poor for adults, more so in an obese patient. Okay. But uh, otherwise, suppose it's a thin patient and it is hypertensive and still doesn't show this thing, then we will worry about low voltages. So we'll think of diseases which gives low voltages in a context. Which are, what are those diseases which gives low voltages? Infiltrative. Emphysema, emphysema sir. Emphysema. But more importantly, in the context, is the infiltrative disease. Infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Like amyloid, isn't it? Even myocardial edema in myocardial is also can cause the whole So, myocarditis or, or, or cardiac amyloid. So, I mean, if you have to integrate as information comes in, you integrate with it and then you see whether it can change anything. So, other thing positive here is the prolonged PR interval. Yes, sir. How does that, does it, uh, sir, uh, this when is the prolonged PR, what do we think? Uh, some amount of a conduction tissue disease uh, may be in the form of uh, infiltrative disorders as we discussed. Possibilities are there. In elderly, it may not be infiltrative disease. It just may be conduction disease like Lenegers and Lev. Yes. So is this a supra um, nodal prolongation or infranodal prolongation? You understand the problem? We yes. are prolonged. It could be infranodal prolongation or supranodal prolongation. How yes, can sir. we find out that? Uh... Because in a elderly, when you see prolonged PR, you are worried whether it's going to go into heart block. If it is supranodal, then not very likely. It's just vagotonia. Quickly. Uh, you can give atropin and uh, it's, uh, atropin will yeah. cause a reduction in uh, PR interval in supranodal, whereas it won't have much effect on infranodal. Or might worsen infranodal. So, so that is what. And uh, one more cause of prolonged PR, which is often forgotten, is thyrotoxicosis. In an elderly lady, apathetic thyroid, hyperthyroidism can present with wide pulse pressure. So she's obese, but in a context, we should think also, because not many people realize that prolonged PR is a part of hyperthyroidism, not hypothyroidism. So we'll just, we know TSH is normal here, but we'll just keep an eye on that. Okay. Uh, one thing, Falgun. Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt. If you see the first ectopic bait. Yes, sir. After that, you are able to, you have an opportunity to look at the first ectopic bait, the previous one, in the limb limbs. Okay, sir. You see the first ectopic bait. After that, you are seeing lead two and AVF. You could see the complexes, and uh, both are showing T inversion and slight down sloping of the ST segment, which completely normalizes the next bit. Yes, it gives an opportunity to see one normal bit and one post ectopic bit, which shows the STT segment changes. Keep it in mind. That is going to be an important clue in this patient, I think. Okay, sir.
we didn't register that and uh, okay let's just see what it means so there is no high suspicion of uh, is, is it like ischemia is it like coronary artery ischemia causing problems uh, uh, be acute MI. Great, sir. Uh, because of uh, three and avf uh, cannot uh, uh, surely uh, rule out the uh, is it acute mi can you have a normal ecg in acute mi uh, Normal ECG in acute MI. Yes, sir. Uh, it can possible, sir. Then the whole cardiology practice will fall. Sir, uh, it, in case of uh, NSTEM, you can take. So the answer is that initial ECG may be normal in up to 10% of the patient. Initial ECG. But within next uh, 30, 40, I mean, next 24 to 48 hours, it will evolve into something or the other. So entirely normal ECG over course of illness would practically rule out MI, unless it's a very small MI or not a very material MI. So practical answer to that is no, but initial ECG could be normal when they present. Index admission could be normal in up to 10%. So ischemia is not entirely ruled out, but uh, this kind of ECG makes it highly unlikely. Okay. Uh, sir, I have a question. Falgun, with all this, what we have discussed till now, how can you explain the systolic murmur which was audible? Uh, uh, madam, I didn't get the uh, the, the clinical examination uh, from the clinical examination after the history, whatever differential diagnosis we discussed, we again came down to possibly accelerated hypertension, heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. Okay. How can we explain the systolic murmur, which was discussed in the clinical examination, I mean, not discussed, presented in the, as a finding? So what, what are other possibilities are there? Uh, madam, it was... Uh, uh... It was a, a pan-systolic murmur that was yep. in the apex. Uh, so what so, could be the reason for a pan-systolic murmur in an elderly female? Uh, madam, uh, it could be uh, uh, based on the location, it could be uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. Madam. So can it be an acute mitral regurgitation which has caused all this? Uh, acute mitral regurgitation uh, an elderly secondary to ischemia is possible man. Uh, ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation murmurs are better audible or uh, uh, less audible than the valvular murmur valvular primary valvular pathology in case of a papillary muscle rupture uh, then it is uh, very much audible otherwise it will be soft murmur compared to the organic uh, primary valvular pathology so the, some answers are that it could be a degenerative mitral valve disease or a papillary muscle dysfunction. And we, we have echo, etc. So we can have a look at that and then come back to the question. Yeah. So we know that there is some MR and whether the worsening is because of MR or MR is uh, part of it, we'll maybe be able to see for the, uh, I mean, from the next. Okay. This is poor man's TMT when you see ST depression after this thing. So pen system murmur. Uh, now, okay, let's see the X-ray. Uh, uh, chest X-ray, which was taken in uh, PA view, it is slightly rotated to the left side, sir. And uh, along with that, there is a, a cardiomegaly with a elevated, I mean, the CP, sorry, the uh, cardio, uh, the, the ratio is more than 0. 0.5. And also there is a, a sclerosis of the, sclerosis and a little calcification of the aortic arch here. And uh, I could see there is a left ventricular, uh, I mean, LV type of apex as well as the left ventricular uh, enlargement. And uh, I'm not very much sure, sir, but uh, there is uh, some amount of uh, playing is there in the uh, bronchi. The angle is more. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Yeah. So LA may be enlarged. So there is ascending out in dilatation with calcification, some cardiomegaly. It's not a bad film and PVH is there, right? And there is a PVH in the form of uh, bad wind appearance. Yeah, so it is in favor of a heart failure okay. and uh, some cardiomegal is there. So it may not be very acute with a, with a hypertensive patient with a unfolded aorta, okay. an 80 year old. Okay, because the story is a lot more to happen. So I'm just slightly winding fast. Okay. Go forward. Uh, coming to the echocardiography, which was done on the uh, uh, fifth day. Uh, dilated right atrium and uh, along with that a dilated left atrium with uh, uh, significant elevation of uh, LV uh, diastolic dimension of uh, 5.8 centimeter, 58 millimeter. Along with that a severe mitral regurgitation with a central jet. 
with a significant uh, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension of uh, with a rv systolic pressure of 70 mm mercury with a preserved lv function and uh, no valve motion abnormalities next yeah something more yeah so so we'll just i think the game begins now so what do we know from so far so we know that uh, ejection fraction seems to be normal there is significant mm -hmm. mr yes, some cardiomegaly and severe peh yes sir so pe cardiomegaly tells us that the story is not very acute yes sir and peh tells us that it is not very chronic because yes. if it was a chronic mr then you would not get so, so much of peh uh, possibly this is a acute worsening of uh, on top of the chronic problem sir acute worsening on top of chronic problem yeah, I, i agree with you to me also it looks like a acute on chronic mr and the cause of mr whether we can have a echo again so what how do we think around this what could be the causes of mr yes sir uh, uh, the uh, the valve morphology is uh, not well delineated in this picture sir yeah. i would like to see first the valve morphology yeah i agree uh, with you okay. we didn't have a good, very good look at the valve morphology but what are what all we want to see in valve morphology uh, the the thickening and subvalvular apparatus the valve per se as well as the subvalvular apparatus we have to see so could it be ischemic with, mr yes sir along with the papillary muscle sir uh, uh, ischemic mr is uh, uh, it is a little unlikely because uh, there is no valve motion abnormality yeah. but uh, uh, but still it is possible sir so is, as you say is it a mitral valve prolapse degenerative mr Yes, sir. Uh, to comment that uh, mitral valve uh, prolapse, uh, we should see the morphology, no, sir. Like uh, the uh, okay. the. Then good look, but probably the report wise there is no prolapse. So yes, sir. Yes, sir. we can take that out. But otherwise, we would like to see whether there is any caudal rupture, mitral valve prolapse, any yes. flail leaflet, or a degenerative mitral valve or mitral neural calcium, yes, or a, any regional focal calcium or a focal regional wall. So it doesn't seem to be there. Yes. LV seems to be reasonably good. Yes. and there is mr so in presence of mr we know lv ejection fraction can be fallacious it yes. might look more better than what it is actually even so it is not looking very impressive so it seems to me that it is basically uh, mr without not a, not from valve it seems to be a secondary mr but uh, i don't know whether we, we so we don't have a you know ready made uh, better video to show the leaflets but so far as we know leaflets are normal we would like to see the tenting part whether secondary mr is because of a tenting whether the mr is coming up to the annulus so if i tell you that it looks like it, uh, lv ejection fraction normal and mr so the question is can you have mr with a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction can you have mr in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction secondary mr and uh, anybody can answer that yes sir it can have it can be possible when a hypertensive crisis like in, the, in this patient it can be possible and but some uh, other causes uh, are also known like uh, when there is a sudden onset of lbvb or when there is a basal wall hypokinesia like in a basal taco sabo cardiomyopathy all these are some possibilities of excellent so it is not that if you see when there is a secondary mr from reduced ejection fraction we all are aware that there is a dilated annulus there is a you know poor contraction tethering so that is everyone knows that reduced ejection fraction but which is what is not very well known is that in presence of preserved ejection fraction also you can have secondary mr And, and for for various reasons, some of them Pavan has said. So it could be hyper heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and a secondary MR, or it could be valvular MR in an elderly. You can have a endocarditis causing MR from vegetation from rupture, which is not there. So the picture so far looks like high heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with some MR. Now is it a severe MR? And why there is PH then? How do we account for such severe PH? So, what are the phenotypes of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Sir, uh, hypertensive heart failure. Uh, I mean. Severe hypertension is there, so hypertensive heart failure. Remember, but that would generally show with reduced ejection fraction. No, it won't be such a nice normal ejection fraction. It's a diastolic dysfunction. Sir. The diastolic dysfunction is there. So, do they have pH? Can you have PA pressure of ninety in a patient with diastolic dysfunction? Uh, sir, uh, PAH in case of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation, it uh, indicates that uh, one means uh, it is a chronic severe MR, or else uh, it is a, a mild MR, uh, mild chronic mild MR. On top of it, uh, there is acute worsening. Yeah. So, so either acute, acute MR, as you are saying, acute MR can cause PAH, yes, or PAH can be because of LV EDP raised. Yes, sir. So, so uh, but can you have such severe PAH in a patient with diastolic heart failure? 
what Karthik says. Is PA pressure of seventy to eighty millimeters systolic part of a diastolic heart failure? Sir, yes, sir. PH PH is part of diastolic heart failure, sir. No, how much? Can they succeed PH? Unlikely, only unlikely only uh, like that. She's obese as well. Heart so possibility of OSA in the background. Yeah, I mean, other cause of PH will rule out. But currently, first we answer this. So, amongst the phenotypes of diastolic heart failure, if you see the data data in detail, they are indistinguishable by the level of PH. You cannot see PA pressure and tell it is diastolic heart failure or not. So, they it can cause serious PH. In fact, it is very well known that patient with diastolic heart failure and MR have a high PA pressure, and and more so in an elderly because they have reserves reserves are limited. So, a PA pressure of eighty ninety in a patient of MR. If the diastolic heart failure, I am not really surprised. It is, it can very well happen. Although one should keep an eye whether OSA or other causes could be there. So this could be consistent with the diastolic heart failure with secondary MR and a PH. So uh, what uh, the other one thing from Kochi Tanmay is saying that one should rule out CT PH. So can CT PH occur in an ambulatory patient? She is moving about. She was just fine. Shall we consider CT PH? Shiranga, what do you think of CT PH in an ambulatory patient? It's still possible, uh, but uh, history-wise, we did not get a stuttering or a, 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 a worsening of the heart failure or uh, dyspnea. So our echo is not showing. Likely. No, but, uh, but the point is, how often PH occur in an ambulatory patient? Uh, pulmonary embolism occur in an ambulatory patient. So fully 25% of acute pulmonary embolism are ambulatory. So it's not that their ambulatory PH, uh, CT PH, or acute pulmonary embolism is not to be thought of. It it has to be thought of. There is a history of varicosity a little bit, but the total picture wise, it doesn't seem very likely because severe hypertension has happened and that has also caused symptoms. And our right side is generally not dilated, is functioning well. TR is just there, but RV is not dilated. So RV is not facing such bad afterload. It is hold, holding on whatever. So I, I think it looks less likely. There is no ECG changes suggestive of right ventricular problems. So we'll consider that possibility, but looks less likely. So far, to me, it seems like uh, diastolic heart failure with secondary MR and acute or chronic because of severe hypertension. Yes, Rinaus, anything to be added? Dr. Rinaus? Yeah, uh, I think I agree with uh, Dr. Kotari. I think they basically looks like diastolic heart failure. Uh, uh, with some probably some degree of uh, pre-existing MR, which has uh, got uh, exacerbated now, and the severity has increased, uh, um, maybe secondary to accelerated hypertension, and uh, that might have uh, taken up the uh, the uh, the uh, pulmonary artery pressure to higher levels. Uh, pulmonary embolism as a possibility, the theoretical possibility, we should keep in mind, but. Uh, well, probably with severe MR being there and with uh, by age and enlargement, um, probably I think uh, some degree of pulmonary hypertension could be pre-existing and it, uh, the levels might have gone up now with uh, MR severity increase. Yeah. And all those and the other cause of severe hypertension, episodic severe hypertension, because we are looking like a CPC thing, we will keep in mind pheochromocytoma, carcinoid syndrome, some other things which can acutely you know, cause that, but doesn't seem to be very likely. There are no, you know, accompanying system or uh, symptoms are not suggestive of a pheo or carcinoid or uh, any other cause of uh, intermittent hypertension. Okay, so we'll move forward. We have to, I think a little bit, I'm going to give you a time situation. We are a little behind, so we can move on. Uh, sir, yes, sir. Uh, the coronary angiogram was done on the uh, next, uh, after two days, uh, which was showing uh, uh, a lady lesion borderline LED lesion around 60-70% uh, here. Yeah. So one of the most unusual situations that coronary stent was not done by a cardiologist after doing this NGO because he thought it is not required. So I, I just, then, just uh, slightly uncommon. So his scheme was not there. <laughs> so, so we'll go to the next. Bhupati did do a FFR and realized that it is really not the cause in this particular patient. So left her without a stent, great, and left right, her on medical therapy. Normal. So she improved on medical therapy, came to OPD for twice, and then we go forward because the story actually begins later on. This FFR was normal. Yes, sir. FFR was normal. Yeah. So uh, in interest of time, ischemia, put this. With a borderline uh, LED yeah. yeah. So then she was put on uh, treatment for blood pressure 
and treatment of decongestion and she was okay for two months right yes sir uh, just but, uh, but uh, i would like to tell here sir uh, yeah. she she could have put on uh, at least a single antiplatelet here it was next sir okay taken she was atherosclerotic and she is not put on any antiplatelets yes sir okay and uh, along with that uh, this poor lady has uh, 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 acid peptic disease with uh, significant past history yes along with that uh, she must have been put on uh, some pantoprazole or uh, any ppi uh, taken taken and then some maybe little more diuresis than indepamide it is very mild one but she did well with the control of pressure she settled down for about 2 months and go ahead next yes uh, uh she followed up for uh, three successive opds uh, with uh, 30 days apart so she was uh, doing well with a uh, good functional capacity and uh, echo was uh, unevent- it was normal uh, with uh, no significant changes of uh, ecg also comparing with the previous ecg and uh, this is the post discharge uh, echocardiogram uh here it uh, yeah okay and uh, coming to the second admission she got uh, this time she landed up with a even worse situation uh, after about 5 uh, 5 five, five to 6 months patient again came to the er with a uh, uh, worst breathlessness with the class 4 dyspnea as well as uh, Uh, with a uh, desaturation uh, with a, a significant elevation of her blood pressure again uh, coming to the er and uh, uh, along with that patient had uh, acute pulmonary edema and the ecg shows uh, not much difference from the previous ecg it was okay yes and later patient have worked up with this Uh, uh, blood investigations which showed uh, mild azotemia compared with the previous admission it was uh, 0.6 or 0.7 previously now it is elevated and along with that there is a significant uh, hyperkalemia as well and uh, if we see here i can see uh, there is a, a qt prolongation here it is a, a patient has a, a hyperkalemia and i would like to see the magnesium also here with the uh, nt pro bnp levels are elevated 2300 patient was admitted in uh, uh, ccu uh, they did uh, uh, covid 19 was uh, negative patient was managed with uh, niv therapy uh, with uh, well maintained uh, spo2 levels and uh, treated the blood pressure with uh, ntg infusion along with that uh, the pulmonary edema was treated with iv fluoroscopy uh this is the thing sir okay so worsening of heart failure with worsening of mr and pulmonary edema yes sir and this time there is pleural effusion also bilateral so she is really in heart failure yes sir and mr is also severe but the the ventricle contractions looks reasonably same yes sir nothing suggest of amyloid there because i mean it's, it's not very hypertrophic speckling yes, so sir. that one part we are not really seriously considering so go ahead uh this time patient had uh, the echo was repeated grade 4 uh, torrential mr along with a significant uh, tr and uh, severe uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension yeah this is the same thing right next yeah uh, during the time of uh, icu course uh, she was noted to have a significant uh, sorry she was noted to have irregular rhythm with a wide variation of uh, heart rate between 35 to 120 it was noted by the duty registrar uh, however ecg was n- not done uh, patient was m- uh, managed with the inotrope and uh, she is off the iv vasodilators and uh, patient was remained on uh, niv therapy so basically worsening of heart failure with uh, worsening of high blood pressure and the worsening of mr also so this yes, is like another another admission for acute decompensated heart failure which is not uncommon in people with heart failure with resection infection yes sir and there is nothing suggestive of ischemic heart disease addition or any other intercurrent illness so far as we can pick up hemoglobin is not dropped slight worsening of renal functions are there which can be age related or related to you know 
hypertension. Go for it. Then something more worse happened, and she showed complete heart block. Then go ahead because time is less. We'll just come to the crux. Yes, sir. Uh, due to the wide variation of uh, the heart rate, uh, proceeded with the uh, Holter monitoring. which revealed a complete heart block we can see here uh, and uh, due to the complete heart block uh, proceeded with uh, dddr uh, pacemaker implantation a patient remained on uh, asvp rhythm uh, for about 48 hours uh, however uh, later patient had uh, asvs with the asvp component of 22% here we can see the uh, 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 rv pacing uh subsequently uh, uh patient required nav support uh, for quite some time and then uh, she was weaned off from the nav support and uh, gradually she was shifted to the ward later on the day 7 uh, patient was planned for discharge however patient uh, suddenly developed the breathlessness uh, while going to the restroom and uh, her saturation she was uh, desaturated along with uh, uh, some amount of a tachycardia with a significant elevation of blood pressure on physical examination she found to have uh, pan systolic murmur again at uh, apex and hence uh, she was transferred to the uh, cardiac icu uh, again initiated on niv support uh, hypertensives anti hypertensives were uh, optimized uh, along with initiation of uh, iv ntg Uh, this time uh, slight elevation of uh, nt pro bnp comparing with the admission bnp and on ecg it was showing uh, sinus tachycardia with uh, asvs rhythm the uh, here we can see the torrential mitral regurgitation again uh, it is a, a grade 4 severity with a uh, uh, vmax of uh, more than 4 here you can see later uh, she was put on uh, invasive mechanical ventilation and uh, her blood pressure came down uh, by adding the hydralazine and the nifedipine then gradually the uh, anti hypertensive dose was uh, tapered off and uh, adjusted as per the requirement on day 9 patient became uh, oliguric with a urine output of 25 to 30 ml per hour uh, while she was on iv furosemide infusion on day 11 uh, gradually her creatinine uh, 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 shooted up with uh, uh, it it most likely looking like a pre renal azotemia kind of picture because uh, urea is elevated significantly than comparing with uh, creatinine I'll, on day 12 patient uh, totally became anuric uh, then uh, she was uh, initiated on hemodialysis but not able to wean off from the ventilator and uh, 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 and then uh, gradually the hemodialysis con- uh, continued for uh, four more days patient became anuric with uh, procalcitonin of uh, 0.6 and creatinine shooted up to 3.1 then the uh, the next day patient was uh, patient underwent the tra- transesophageal echocardiogram uh, because of uh, assessing the suitability of uh, mitral clip Uh, in view of uh, recurrent uh, episodes of mitral reg- significant mitral regurgitation associated with uh, hef cuff uh, options of air lifting was considered uh, then uh, uh, before proceeding for uh, transesophageal echo uh, uh, the transthoracic echocardiogram was done surprisingly this time she was found to have uh, grade 1 mitral regurgitation with uh, 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 no significant uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressure Uh, 3d echocardiogram uh, on te showed grade 2 uh, maximum of a grade 2 with uh, no significant valve pathology observed in the 3d echocardiogram and uh, patient was uh, initially assessed for uh, mitral clip uh, placement uh, however it was uh, declined the the plan was uh, declined uh, due to the uh, 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 not yes. satisfying the criteria then so now if we can summarize things basically hypertension high heart failure with rejection fraction secondary mr maybe secondary mr cause of mr we'll see this mr is fluctuating this mr is showing and it is not unknown that mr is load dependent so if you have a preload afterload 
change mr will change so this is to my mind clearly telling us that valve is not the problem it is the ventricle which is causing this mr yes, now sir. chasing this mr for changing her uh, thing is probably not going to make uh, you know it's not going to improve now we have remember we are looking at the case retrospectively we have now looking at the eyes at the back we know if clinical story what happened and then we are trying to find out something peculiar so, but we are struck by the renal deterioration now can the renal deterioration be only atn because the pressures are docked markedly so any patient elderly patient with renal artery stenosis if to drop pressure it could really give rise to atn or renal failure so renal doppler was done to rule out renal artery stenosis and apparently it was normal it was normal now renal doppler is not a good test for renal artery stenosis you know we all rely on this but if you read the literature renal doppler is not as great a test it is only good when the values are about 300 or if it is very clear so you must have a cross talk with the person who is doing it and see the degree of reliability plus in a obese elderly you may not be able to fully re- rule out renal artery stenosis the point is you may not have totally excluded renal artery stenosis and the other thing very surprising is the pressure dropping to 90 with nifedipine 20 and adrenalin adrenalin is not a good drug for diastolic heart failure patient because it will cause tachycardia it will worsen it so adrenalin is not a good choice nifedipine 20 alone causing so much of hypotension is very unusual it can happen in a myeloid patient because it they are sensitive to it but there is nothing else to suggest that so now we are against a situation where mr is coming and going which is not very surprising to me because it is load dependent many times it happens in ot under ga there is not much mr patient comes back and you suddenly find much more mr so somehow or the other this is a diastolic heart failure with valvular with a ventricular mr but the primary problem is why so much of renal failure why she has gone into such shutdown and she is not coming out of it sir uh, possibly the uh, far, uh, it can be uh, pre renal azotemia sir because of uh... so one serious cause could be pre renal azotemia and then it will take but then here we need a nephrology input you know because they do lot of fena versus this urinary osmolality and they are able to tell whether it is a renal uh, you know pre renal thing or something more than that so means something more means we could be having bilateral renal artery uh, thromboembolism or renal artery stenosis something like that yes sir because in a, in a elderly you should not rule out renal artery doppler alone and the setting is quite like atn because of fall in pressure but there could be something more sinister also and the other thing which comes to my mind i will before i hand it over to um, uh, srinivas and sarita is because see the episode which when she came second time she was rather sick she was sweating she had something which we have not picked up could it be a dissection in an elderly patient 80 year old severe hypertension asymptomatic dissections are i mean dissection without symptoms are very well known can that be put be pulling out a trick on causing renal dis, renal deterioration so i have ruled out amyloid because of nothing else but i am not ruled out uh, uh, aortic dissection and i still keep that on mind or a renal artery stenosis so if you look at the x ray 11th slide and 29th slide the x ray has changed that calcification is not there exactly but that is pa and ap film so i cannot overread that because x ray may be normal in a dissection also but i will really keep that in mind the renal artery profile is not like dissection because mostly they should have shown little bit of decomposition but it can it can happen that renal blood flow is still coming so these are the two possibility from my side and let us see i mean we, we are open for you know, other comments so can i have uh, srinivas and uh, yeah. Sar- sarita just, uh, and the on. students quickly yeah just going back to the uh, angiogram uh, though it was a 60 to 70% lesion whenever uh, there is a load issue say with exaggerated hypertension or any other uh, arrhythmia like a, a atrial fibrillation in those scenarios the 60 to 70% uh, lesion could uh, really cause ischemia and that could lead to uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation which could be transient just because the ffr was 0.87 it doesn't rule out ischemia as a cause for mitral regurgitation in this case and sometimes a 60 to 70% lesion one can have coronary spasm and they can have transient uh, Uh, as a, uh, this uh, um, severe mitral regurgitation however initially the patient did not have chest pain but anyway chest pain is uh, not always uh, there in a, a, especially in elderly women many times we get silent ischemia without chest pain the other manifestations like breathlessness etc we like to take it as markers for this ischemia and whenever we have seen this increase in mr and chest come with present day presented with breathlessness almost always the initial recording of the blood pressure is high again just uh, going with what dr sir was telling that is a load dependent and that is exacerbating the that is exaggerating the mitral regurgitation once the bp is controlled the mr severity uh, documented by doppler has come down and regarding the uh, 
this admission with uh, the going to the renal deterioration well uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the uh, the possibility of dissection through but uh, we, we need to have other biochemical parameters uh, to see the, how the counts are behaving whether uh, there is any change in the blood counts whether there is any change in status of the hemoglobin uh, which could be uh, further aggravating the issues here uh, uh, then uh, how is the uh, urine analysis There's so many things uh, how is the blood picture all these things we will have to uh, consider uh, before of course renal artery doctor is not sensitive as already told by dr uh, totari sir and it would have been nice if the during the initial angiogram period if they had done a renal artery angiogram it would have been very nice uh, considering uh, having well known that the patient had accelerated hypertension severe mitral uh, regurgitation and with a long standing history of hypertension it would have been nice to have an initial uh, uh, arteriogram itself during the initial work up to take coronary angiogram sarita yeah you yes uh, uh, no i i too feel uh, either uh, paroxysmal ischemia precipitating a uh, uh, papillary muscle dysfunction not very sure though and uh, um, uh, the sudden fall in blood pressure with this uh, uh, renal uh, dysfunction and uh, renal shutdown etc must have caused uh, must, might be the possible reasons for this uh, sudden improvement in the mr much more than what we expect um, that's also Okay, um, I think we'll move on in the interest of time. Uh, shall we now ask Dr. Manoj to let the cat out of the bag, or do you want to, Walker? We are really short of time, so let's do yeah. that. Uh, one, question, one question. One question. Doctor, so something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Doctor. Please. Well, I am not a cardiologist, but I am a little surprised at the turn of events. So, what do we have here? We have an elderly lady. who has a accelerated sudden acceleration of hypertension presumably who undergoes an angiogram which shows a multi vessel disease actually if you go back and see the angiogram again i just had a passing glimpse the tightest lesion is actually in the distal circumflex that's an 80% or 90% type lesion and uh, there is a small pd which is coming beyond that so what have we we have a multi vessel disease why was not a flush angiogram done at that time this patient is likely to have a renal issue here we do fly by, uh, by angiography all the time and here is an elderly lady the perfect setting for a renal artery stenosis a sudden acceleration of hypertension and why would we not do it i don't understand this that's one thing second thing here is that so we have one admission and we have a second admission we have some change and deterioration of renal parameters and you look at the ultrasound picture here you have cortical echoes so this patient clearly had a contrast induced nephropathy there is no doubt about it so you gave lot of contrast at the time of coronary angiography the patient comes for a second admission and typically after 5 7 days or so the creatinine rises and we have a mild raise in the creatinine and we have cortical echoes cortical doctor, echoes. no no dr sanjeev that there is a big time gap between the first and the one month is not a long period not one month five months so look let it be complete see what happens with contrast induced nephropathy is that it tends to return to normal in 7 to 10 days but in a group of patients in patients who have an underlying parenchymal abnormality like this patient has they doesn't come back to normal so the baseline is to a higher level that's what has happened in this patient so this is 5 months not 1 month the whatever whatever months. it doesn't matter because it doesn't come yeah. back to the baseline that's what okay. is important yeah but fly by angio would have been a good idea there's no doubt about that 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 should okay I... now can we have uh, i think we'll move on thank you uh, because we're really short of time two more two so more we'll... events happened just just uh, go through the the easy okay to just tell the events alone sir yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. please 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 tell the events palgun she had yeah. atrial fibrillation again she was cardioverted okay. because of fast ventricular rate reverted back with uh, sinusism and then uh, this poor lady also had a massive ge bleed yeah. it was managed successfully with the uh, hemoclip uh, uh, endoscopy revealing ulcer active ulcer with uh, treated by gastroenterology with the hemoclip colonoscopy also done because of frank ge bleed it was a frank ge bleed lower ge also so it was normal so these are the event that has happened at that point of time she could not be weaned off uh, ventilator she could not be weaned out of hemodialysis Uh, but she became hemodynamically stable she would become off uh, vasodilators and off inotropic support yeah that that is where we are we are okay so at this point i think we'll we'll ask dr manoj to take over and uh, 
he will tell us the sequence of events that unfolded after that um uh, thank you uh, krishna kumar and uh, dr nagendra popadi i was uh, delighted to be here listening to the wonderful discussion uh, which is uh, most clinically oriented to look at this uh, uh, unique case of patient with uh, um recurrent heart failure and let me share, share that okay and a progressive uh, renal failure which was not responding to the dialysis and ventilator dependent so as uh, professor kutari has uh, very clearly discussed it's um, sure it's, it's it's predominantly a low dependent situation and uh, since this patient had uh, no significant uh, chest pain neither back pain and uh, there only sample ecgs we have shown she has had at least uh, some 20 ecgs during the course of her stay in the coronary care unit almost uh, twice a day or as required for various uh, arrhythmias and on the holter and the ffr being negative there was no signs of any kind of uh, coronary ischemia or any kind of st deviations of any sort you saw the ecgs which all showed a plain st segment or a normal st segment so i was not considering significantly any kind of ischemic pathology in this patient and um, some of our peers uh, when consulted because it was a unique case and as you saw that patient was even considered for a mitral clip and finally was denied because uh, did not satisfy the criteria so the couple, couple of uh, peers said uh, she is a patient who is doomed and will not have any kind of recovery and uh, we may have to consider a comfort management option with tracheostomy and perhaps uh, initiate on a long term dialysis but however they were out of clinical context because she had an acute kidney failure and never had a, 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 a ckd in the beginning so the renal artery doppler uh, what was shown was just one but it was done twice and it did not show any evidence of uh, renal artery stenosis uh, though we have the limitations in an obese lady who could not hold the breath for uh, appropriate measurement of the flow uh, uh, studies so you have a significant variable mitral dynamic regurgitation with a normal lv system pulmonary function pulmonary artery hypertension and therefore uh, i co- i discussed with the family and the patient and then finally they agreed reluctantly for an invasive catheterization so you would see that uh, i went from the, the coronary angiogram initially was done from the um, radial route and as this patient did not have any indication for uh, ckd or um, even the ultrasound was done at the baseline did not show any um asymmetrical kidneys and cortical medullary differentiation was uh, maintained i did not do a fly through coronary uh, renal angio or abdominal iatogram at that point and since it was a radial route with an unfolded iata i could not negotiate uh, across the unfolded iata i didn't want to do much with the atherosclerotic uh, plaques uh, and calcifications to cause any kind of embolic event so you saw that uh, on, uh, this patient being an obese had a ultrasound guided uh, renal uh, I mean, femoral artery puncture and um, they had a very in, uh, significant uh, um, uh, stenosis or acute uh, hairpin like bend but what was striking was that uh, the blood pressure um, recorded in the infra renal abdominal iota was 62 by 28 with a mean of 41 and um, you would see that uh, beyond that uh, the catheter could be caught and the injection showed a normal visceral arteries and no evidence of any renal artery stenosis so that was much more baffling and again the blood pressure in the um supra renal abdominal iota was 60 by 25 by 40 so it clearly indicates that there was some kind of a disease process in the thoracic iota so the upper limb invasive pressures was being monitored uh through from the radial artery and that showed a gradient peak systolic gradient of 80 and a mean systolic mean gradient of uh, 47 mm of mercury clearly indicating that there is a some obstructive lesions in the thoracic aorta so then she was uh, taken up for a ct iatogram and you would clearly see that uh, this patient had a significantly circumferential dense circumferential calcification of the mid thoracic aorta with the uh, protruding uh, nodules uh, into the thoracic aorta with lumens uh, significantly narrowed Uh, in multiple coronal sagittal and also the um, axial views so that uh, you would see that here is a protruding nodules uh, which is obstructing the 
neck thoracic aorta and the minimal lumen diameter of the thoracic aorta was narrowed up to 2.8 millimeters. I could not get a, even a five French guide, five French um, diagnostic catheter across this occlusion because of multiple projecting nodules, which you see a dense uh, calcific uh, nodule here. So, but for the invasive cath, uh, this patient could not have been diagnosed by any other means. And this was a patient who was confined to this coronary care unit with dialysis and also um, the uh, ventilator. So we decided to revascularize this uh, mid-thoracic aorta. You could see that fluoroscopy uh, showed a, a dense calcification in the mid-thoracic aorta. You could see that on the right side uh, or the medial side of the aorta had dense calcification. So we used a uh, OP and NC four millimeters balloon to initially dilate and then followed by a seven mm uh, shockwave lithotripsy balloon. And subsequently uh, we used a body plane balloon along with the shockwave lithotripsy. You could see the dents there of the nodules uh, expanding and simultaneously the balloon of the body balloon also is dilated to enhance the lumen. And uh, then the um, body balloon as well as the intravascular lithotripsy balloon, the shockwave balloon was interchanged from both the femoral axes. You would see the change of position to deliver the shockwave so that there is effective uh, uh, cracking of the dense calcification. And this is the post uh, uh, shockwave lithotripsy angiogram which shows a distinct improvement in the lumen of the narrow thoracic iota. And this was followed by a stent graft uh, implantation, which is post-dilated. You will see that there was an evening, uh, ioning of uh, even uh, expansion of the balloon. And um, this established an equalization of the pressures. And you would still see that the renal arteries were normal and um, there was a clear uh, equalization of the pressures. So this was a 28 into 28 into 174 valium Navion uh, stent graft, and there was equalization of pressure. Subsequent to this procedure, patient did not have any hemodialysis, renal function returned to normal, her heart failure recovered, she was extubated, her pre-discharge creatinine was 0.68, and uh, these are the peripheral uh, intravascular ultrasound images. You would see this is the uh, proximal uh, descending thoracic aorta, which did not show calcification. But here you see a circumferential calcification with nodular projections. And this is the titus portion where there are multiple nodular projections of calcification uh, in the aorta. And this is again in the below the mid thoracic aorta showing a kind of circumferential calcification. There was also another segment of uh, significant stenosis of uh, dense circumferential calcification. And this is a lower. Uh, uh, thoracic aorta at the hiatus uh, level. And this is the movie you can see a significant uh, projective nodules in the uh, thoracic aorta. So these are the images of the intravascular ultrasound post uh, shock wave. See a significantly enhanced lumen. And uh, this is after the stent graft, you could see the fabric a little folded and constrained before the balloon dilatation. And then the, after the balloon dilatation, you could see the fabric is well uh, expanded and we could achieve uh, equalization of pressures and well, uh, significant luminal gain. So this is the peripheral uh, shockwave lithotripsy balloon, which was used for seven into 60 mm, which can deliver, deliver around 300 shockwave pulses over a seven French uh, uh, sheath system. And um, I happened to visit this patient uh, day before yesterday, and she was able to do all activities of daily living and she was self-caring. She was not on any kind of antihypertensive for the past eight weeks since the discharge. You will see the multiple values of the blood pressure uh, for an 82 year old lady well in the target goal, except uh, there was one value which was 150 by 84, but the diastolic values were normal. Most of the systolic values were normal. She was on statin, aspirin, on amiodarone, and her current creatinine level is 0.66. So let me bring to you to the diagnosis. It's a coral reef iota. You will see there is a significant projecting nodules in the uh, aortic uh, lumen, which was uh, removed uh, by endarterectomy, but these are not my cases, but from the published literature. So coral reef iota is a very rare phenomenon of extreme calcification in the juxta renal and also suprarenal aorta, appearing like growths of akin to the hyperplastic bone. So it is like very, very intensely hard rocky calcium and uh, juts irregularly into the lumen. And this was uh, discovered uh, and described quite long back in, in 16th century by the Swiss anatomist, uh, Johann Jakob uh, Wepfer, who discussed um, in an autopsy specimen of a semicircular 
projecting uh, into the lumen of the upper iota, similar to the bone. And he did say that there are patients who with rheumatoid arthritis and long-term use of steroids could have a, a, a predisposition for this. And this is the diagram that he had drew in the post-operative specimen. You could see multiple calcifications in the iota and all along the course of it. So the deposits of semicircular shape were consistent, uh, varied from gristle to frank bone, and uh, the coral reef atherosclerosis of uh, suprarenal iota uh, um, was uh, subsequently discussed and described in 1986, uh, and with the in-hospital mortality of close to 13.3%. So these are some of the specimens uh, discussed in various medical literatures. You would see in, in very, very clearly the coral reef-like pictures on the aortic specimen and uh, that were all removed by endarterectomy and uh, some of the other images from some of the other cases you could see the whole of the abdominal lumen is filled with uh, calcification and these are the histopathological specimens where you see the uh, calcifications here projecting into the lumen. So for many of the coral reef aorta patients the nature and extent of the disease uh, is not discovered until an imaging is performed due to the vascular complications the prevalence is around 0.6 to 1.8 percent of patients with atherosclerotic disease, which are diagnosed with the uh, coral reef iota. The mean age of patient is quite uh, surprisingly uh, less than 60 years of old, and the literature says it's about one decade earlier than the atherosclerotic uh, disease appears in that group. So some more uh, cases uh, which have been discussed in the literature, uh, these are the coral reef uh, um, thick calcific projections in the infrarenal and suprarenal iota. This is a much more extensive disease in the uh, abdominal iota. You could see here uh, again, there's a complete occlusion with the calcification in the abdominal iota. So the pathogenesis, they say that its detailed mechanism is uh, still remains uncertain. Um, Carboxylated uh, matrix GLA protein, which is the UCM GFP and fetuin A uh, levels have been shown to be markedly lower in these patients as compared to the healthy control and uh, these uh, molecules uh, are really essential uh, to reduce the formation of hydroxyapatite. So UGMP and also fetuin A suppress the calcification and particularly the fetuin A inhibits the formation of hydroxyapatite by binding the cal complex to the calcium and phosphorus. So it was uh, Kerford uh, in 1984 who coined the term coral reef iota in one of his uh, nine patients uh, uh, he noted over 13 years period. So this is another lady who is uh, still awaiting for similar procedures, a 72-year-old lady with two episodes of acute pulmonary edema with no coronary artery disease, two segments of uh, coral reef uh, aortic calcific projections and awaiting for endovascular treatment. The endovascular stent graft may be a less risky alternative for all these uh, years. Uh, the surgical endarterectomy has been very morbid procedure and this is now considered as a covered endovascular repair of paravisceral aorta, which is termed as CERPA or SERPA. So uh, this is 70 uh, patients, a single center experience of coral reef aorta with a mean age of 59.5, uh, 24 men and predominantly women have been affected the range of age from 14 years up to 81 years. The most frequent finding was a renal vascular hypertension, intermittent claudication and chronic visceral ischemia. One of these were there in our patient. However, severe heart failure and arterial hypertension were distinctly identified as the clinical counterpart of uh, aortic uh, stenosis. Eight patients uh, uh, in this series of 11.6% died soon after the surgery. Significant clinical improvement were noted in about 84% of patients. Overall rate of complications were about one third in this population. Uh, you will see that a case of a rapidly progressive kidney dysfunction with a severely calcific stenotic aorta was uh, published from Japan, and they found that the endovascular treatment of the stenotic iota improved the renal functions dramatically, and surgical complications of stenotic uh, may be successfully treated by endovascular therapy. Coral reef uh, iota is an unusual possible cause of heart failure, once again uh, reported in International Journal of Cardiology in uh, 2014. Severe heart failure, prolonged pleural effusion, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension comprised a rare symptomatology revealing coral reef iota, and this patient was undergoing a surgical revascularization. There was another case report of refractory heart failure and intermittent claudication secondary to cipravirinal coral reef iota, which was published recently in uh, November 2020. And you would see this is a specimen removed, which showed a distinct coral reef-like uh, 
projective nodules of calcification within the lumen. And uh, another case which was reported in the literature is an unusual and catastrophic presentation of a coral reef iota. This was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis with a long-term systemic steroid. It's very interesting that in 16th century, uh, the Swiss anatomist had conceived that this patient could be a possible, uh, which was detected recently. So this is presented with a shock of unknown etiology with a daily ejection fraction of 10%. Echocardiography showed a moderate mitral regurgitation. The femoral artery approach was taken and they could not uh, get the guide wire advanced in the usual manner and resistance was felt in the arch. And then a CT iotogram was done, which showed a, an occlusive calcification in the distal arch or the mid aortic arch. And the iotography was performed we showed a subtotal occlusion and patient died within 12 hours without getting treatment properly. This is the same case. Uh, we could see the occlusion of uh, calcification in these patients with uh, arched occlusion. So finally, let me conclude. Uh, coral reef iota is a condition of extreme atherosclerosis and calcification of the iota that can present with post uh, iotic valve severe obstruction. Women tend to be more affected in a ratio of 1.6 is to 1. It remains a possibility that we have to strongly consider in elderly with refractory heart failure, LV dysfunction, or those with varying dynamic mitral regurgitation. Mid thoracic, descending thoracic iota remains an inaccessible blind spot for conventional bedside imaging in these sick patients. And therefore, we need to explore uh, beyond uh, the bedside imaging. So, endovascular intervention provides an alternative choice while the traditional surgical enterectomy or bypass is more risky and invasive. Debulking may be required, as in this case of report in the literature, you could do a, a, a rotablation of the calcified disease sometimes to cause an in, a lumen to deliver further um, measures and to have a large aortic vessel intervention. So let me conclude, we have an effective tool of interventional cardiology and radiology that has been baffled us all these years for finding a solution to dense calcified rocky or stony heart, bony heart, arterial occlusions that cause uh, impasse in the delivery of devices as well as for reperfusion. So this case illustrates how successfully and effectively any amount of dense and heavy calcific occlusions in the artery can be simply revascularized or access can be created through a shockwave IV lithotripsy. We can certainly coin a, a new therapy which is called the shower or showers, which stands for the shockwave endovascular repair uh, and showers if there's a stent placement. Thank you so much for allowing me to present this case and choosing my case for this first inaugural uh, master case discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. I, <laughs> this is really too much. <laughs> Only thing is if somebody could have palpated a femoral, but in an obese 80 year old, one would not go for femoral, but suppose one had femoral pulse, then you would have zoomed down on the aorta, isn't it? This is wonderful. Yes, Excellent. that is the message for sure. Um, any comments, final comments from the other faculty and the students, and then we quickly go on to Dr. Mathur and Dr. Sanjeev Sharma for their expert comments. An excellent case, an excellent beginning, beginning to this uh, program of TNP Grand Promise. And we have to thank Dr. Manoj and Dr. Bhupati for uh, providing us this excellent Absolutely, they have been the stars. So I think I'll go on to Dr. Atul Mathur and then I'll ask Dr. Sanjeev Sharma to comment. Dr. Mathur, you're frozen, your image is frozen. I think there's some internet. Dr. Sanjeev, can you comment? Oh yes, this was a very interesting case. So a mediotic syndrome kind of physiology which prevails in, 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 in this situation. So the, it shows the dramatic impact that shockwave therapy is actually bringing into revascular recanalization of uh, densely calcified vessels, whether it is in the peripheral extremity or whether, uh, uh, for me, this aorta uh, usage is the first actually. The only thing is a small caveat here, a small word of caution here is whenever we use this lithotripsy, it, it causes a lot of peripheral embolization. Uh, it can actually, though the conceptually they say that it pulverizes into such small micron, a few micron sized particles that it may not be clinically relevant. But nonetheless, in the setting of uh, visceral arteries, it can sometimes become uh, an, an issue. But this is a case very well managed. An excellent demonstration, actually, of how uh, timely intervention can uh, make all the difference. But I guess, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a, a flush autogram at the time of coronary angiography would have saved many blushes <laughs> to, to, to start with. Yes. Easy to uh, say. Uh, we're not routinely used to doing um, any kind of autogram in patients from the radial route because uh, it was a practice uh, almost many years back, but uh, now um, we don't do it anymore. 
I think uh, one red herring was the uh, was that the terrible pulses were felt. The second thing is that only one fundus being normal with severe uh, hypertension is also a clue, as Dr. Uh, uh, Kotari was pointing out, the cooperation of paratus, one condition where the fundus is normal. So, in the mid aortic syndromes, also, I think it should be normal. We're using the same analogy. Dr. Mathur? Yeah, Mathur, go ahead. So, uh, this has been a very baffling case for. Uh, coral reef aorta is the expect case uh, how it does. You're, you're uh, breaking off so you could actually turn off your video and talk. It would be easier. I think we're losing him, Doc. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. KK, just one yes, point. Please. Uh, yes. This uh, this patient had this stenosis at the time of first admission itself. It is uh, virtually like bilateral renal artery stenosis. Uh, but the valsartan, which was administered, did not cause any renal deterioration. But at the time of admission, during the second time, or during the follow-up, the creatinine remained okay, and even the initial creatinine in the second admission was almost normal, 1.2 at the max. So whenever we have bilateral renal artery stenosis like scenario, uh, the mm -hmm. AS or ARB, so, um, they sometimes cause trouble. Yeah. In this patient, it is not, I mean, uh, whether all the renal uh, impairment that occurred during the second admission could be explained by this obstruction alone. It doesn't, doesn't cause the renal failure in all of them. It depends on the mean pressure and the gradients. So one can say autoregulation would work in some. So um, yeah, I, I mean, take your point, but it's a surprising, isn't it? It happens in practice many times. Some will go, some will not do. In fact, the renal the acute kidney injury started setting in after uh, I had yeah, discussed this with uh, Bhupati and many others uh, in my peers. Uh, so they said we have to effectively bring down the hypertension. So hypertension, of course, at 130, 135 systolic pressures and diastolic of around 65 to 70. Also, she was having a variable dynamic mitral debilitation. Almost every day she was having an echocardiography done. Uh, so we finally decided uh, we add this uh, nifedipine and hydrolysin. Of course, it was added in a stage manner. And then once there was hypotension, and that's the time that the acute kidney injury set in and there was no recovery from that. Dr. Mathur has joined us finally. Can you just comment? Sorry. Oh, so I'll, I'll make a brief comment. So basically, coral reef aorta should have been a chronic problem. So it is amusing and we did not suspect it because uh, of the acute presentation of this patient. She has just started coming with acute LVF. So the more uh, stronger suspicion would be on coronary artery disease or renal oh. artery stenosis in such cases. Oh. But of course, uh, it was a great case. And uh, probably the associated coronary artery disease, it was moderate in some places and significant in others, may have contributed to these acute exacerbations in this patient. So very, very well done case and a very well handled. The IVL has really uh, saved the day for this patient. This shock where lithotripsy does anybody need special training for that, Dr. Manoj? Uh, is, is it? Uh, no, sir. It's a very simple to use tool, just like any balloon. Only thing you need a shock wave delivery console, which the um, the vendor brings it, and then uh, there's a connector there. Um, maybe I didn't show that if I, uh, uh, slide on that, but it's very effective and it's simple just, uh, yeah. tool. Actually, just a little very simple bulky balloon uh, as compared to the normal balloon. To handle, in I fact. See. It's a fantastic yeah. thought, but. Great case. Okay, so at this point, we really hopelessly run out of time. We have 10 more minutes. I mean, we have passed the time limit by 20 minutes, but it's been such a good case so that everybody stayed engaged. Uh, how do you suggest we use the remaining 10 minutes, Prabhakar? I, I, I've been a bit unfair to Dr. Sanjeev Sharma and Atul Mathu, who, who are bound to get another invitation to do this quiz, which they have I planned. was actually going to apologize to both of them because no, absolutely no problem. A lot of preparation, and they were going to show many. So we just went. I think this is some of the hiccups where you have when you start, and I think we lost some time in the initial banter, maybe around 15 20 minutes. Hopefully, I mean, I'm sure it will not happen in the future. We saw a great case, <laughs> so we yeah, okay. compensate for, for everything else. Any yeah. comments from the students, you can ask them to say something. Yes, so, I think the students can give their comments on, on what they're... Can I ask? Maybe I should ask Sriranga and then Pavan and then, of course, uh, 
I should ask Karthik as well. What are your main take-home points here? You can uh, one by one come up with your take-home points. Maybe Karthik, you can start. So uh, one thing I had uh, learned from this is clinical examination in initial time is uh, at most importance. Uh, femoral artery pulses uh, in an obese lady will be difficult, but um, in this case would have clinched the diagnosis at an earlier time. And uh, this particular condition is uh, new and management was ext extraordinary and uh, we learned a lot from this. Pawan? Sir, one thing uh, I wanted, like I know, uh, I understood is like uh, four limb BP measurement should have been helpful in this patient. Uh, since uh, lower limb BP might have been low in this patient, but that would have been changed at the diagnosis early. The, other is uh, whether to do uh, re Doppler or other invasive study early in this patient since the clinical profile more, more is like in a renal artery stenosis. So one question which I want to ask all the students is, what is one thing that you liked about this case? And what is one thing that we could have done differently to arrive at an early diagnosis? Maybe we could ask Falgon himself. Others who are participating, 100, they can write something in their chat box. And so whatever, they, whatever they felt like, you know. Yeah, so I'm looking at that as well. Um, so renal, Dr. Anthony Wilson says renal angio. While CAG. Yeah, but he uh, pointed out that... We talked about that. We talked about flyby angiogram. That's true. Break your femoral delay. Same thing, female feeling the femorals is very important. It's going to be very difficult in this uh, lady, 34 BMI. And actually, even lower limb BP is very, very difficult in a very obese lady. Honestly, very few of us would actually. Uh, you'll get a systolic while putting the BP cuff on the calf, and, and it, it's not very practical. But yes, I, it's something I, could be done. I don't know. Two things strike me. I think one, uh, whenever the fundus is normal, in the face of severe hypertension, there are very few conditions which can cause that. And I think we should suspect none. And uh, anything related to that, I would uh, think that should be one uh, possibility. The other thing, what might have happened is that the higher blood pressure in the upper uh, segment was actually helping perfuse the kidney, I suppose, and uh, the reduction because of uh, high antihypertensive dose. Was it causing that uh, renal hypoperfusion? Okay, I want to say one thing. You see, it, clinical medicine, clinical decision is most contextual. The yes. primary, single primary in, important aspect is to raise the clinical context. Here, our mind was quite detracted by MR. Yes. And if we were taken earlier decision that this MR is not the problem, we could think again about the other yes. things. And, and uh, nobody will go and palpate a femoral in, in an obese 80-year-old like that. So it is easy now, it looks like that. But so, so raising a correct context is most important. And the correct context Maybe in this context case is to ask the blood supply of the mitral valve, the papillary muscles. If anybody of the students would like to comment on that. Anterior, yes, and sir. The Anterior is uh, LAD and LCX, sir. Like uh, posterior medial is uh, RCA, sir. Yeah, that's right. So did we have any coronary artery disease in that area in this Sir, patient? this is a LAD, LAD 60 to 70 percent borderline lesion. It is uh, unlikely to cause uh, uh, anterior mitral leaflet uh, uh, infarct and then uh, anterior, sorry, ant anterolateral. Uh, no, MR has disappeared after the treatment of uh, aorta. That yes. is also saying that the coronary ischemia yeah. is not a real player. Yeah. So it was just a combination of two, maybe. Yeah, it could be but contributory. It is usually the first diagonal. So you know, if you have a mid LED or something, that is usually not going to cause your uh, mitral regurgitation. Yes, sir. But this sir, patient uh, also had a sub lesion actually in the distal circumflex. That is tighter than the LAD lesion. That may have, uh, but 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 we do know that the MR disappeared. So clearly, ischemia was not an issue. But nonetheless, for the sake of completion, there is a lesion there. There is a very important take home here, but that's not for the cardiology audience actually. It is for the those people who are doing Dopplers. See, the problem with renal Doppler is everybody yes. focused on Tardus parvus. And in the process, they miss out the basic. So renal Doppler must always begin with the aortic uh, peak systolic velocity. And you must take a RAR ratio, that is renal artery to aorta ratio. If, if this, fo this focus has been maintained, one would have immediately seen an altered waveform in the proximal uh, aorta and would have diagnosed the problem.
but unfortunately in our most renal doctors these days focus is on the segmental arteries in the kidneys and in the process we miss out the big picture fantastic that's a very one, one, one question student has asked is bilateral absent tbl so that is seen in normal person 2% of normal population so that is not actually relevant to the i mean it can be the point is that we should know that it can happen in normal people and also we should consider the peripheral artery disease considering the age also no sir like That's possible of any old any 80 year 80 year old could have that but there was no overriding reason to think of that but any atherosclerotic person can have that yes i think case is it's extremely interesting and extremely well managed i don't think many people would really think once she is on hemodialysis and gone like that most of us would have thought that now nothing much can be done so this is actually a great uh, you know thought in that sense that I pursue 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 if we get another patient like this yeah. i mean can we accelerate by any means of diagnosing that this is earlier i mean bad I mean, just for the learning purpose should be i mean kind of second admission itself should we have done a ct angiography earlier i mean i don't know i don't know it's only the the process of uh, getting hypotension and going for anuria that stimulated us so oh, we are definitely missing something there that was the thing that stimulated us even with the dialysis sir uh, dr mono sir went ahead with doing that cat diagnosing everything uh, if we get another patient is there a way we can accelerate the diagnosis earlier uh, that we can't do retinal angiography for all hypertensive patient we know we have data that it's not going useful in patients with controlled hypertension so uh, is there any other way in our practice we can uh, make the diagnosis earlier so that we can help more uh, patient earlier i think this is all hindsight and hindsight you can do but think, uh, but for a mid suspected mid aortic syndrome a careful abdominal ultrasound and a duplex examination actually can be very very useful oh one i think the point that dr kothari made in the two approaches he shows in the beginning he says one i could use it as a cpc which he did towards the end but in the beginning he used it to uh, actually discuss every little aspect of the case presentation and bring out the the salient features i think that uh, merged very beautifully of course we lost some time but that was well worth it i think sir, i have fantastic. a doubt i have a doubt sir yes sir uh, in case of a bilaterally symmetrical uh, kidneys uh, how come the suspicion of uh, renal artery stenosis came sir Uh, you know bilateral symmetry should answer that dr sanjeev is there yeah. so falgun the real artery shrinkage and all happens at a much later stage an elderly person atherosclerotic developing severe hypertension you can have real artery so is a normal kidney very well only later severe ischemic kidney for long term is going to be a shrunken one okay sir. second is like bhupati has one thing we all have to remember is we are usually adapt with looking at the echo Suprasternal view and uh, subclavian, but we miss the thoracic aorta. Sometimes a parasternal long axis view with a little rotation, you will be able to image the thoracic aorta. We may not be at other times, but I think we can make a habit. For your question, we can make a habit of evaluating thoracic aorta with the emerging interventional techniques, the T R everything. That may be a we can develop that habit. I think. Yes, sir. Uh, my uh, suggestion to Professor Krishna Kumar and uh, Professor Kothari is that. I, after uh, managing this patient, um, I was just thinking because this is in the COVID pandemic, uh, many HRCT chest has been done, and calcification can be easily uh, understood from the plain CT scan of the thorax. I think with all this uh, data available, we can institutional can look into the prevalence of this, which is often missed and perhaps not considered. The true prevalence, perhaps, in this population, especially when elderly mm -hmm. population, could be much higher than what we really think. Yeah. yeah but it would still be a rare disease you know there will be some um, uh, it's, it's a new thing for me i really didn't know anything about coral reef aorta yes right i think uh, we are at time so uh, we are uh, all, we have all, run out of time yeah, i all, think we have to uh, yeah, to wind up i think from the audience uh, side i think we'll say thumbs up to both of you i think you're well begun and uh, <laughs> i would like to add only one small word sir uh, not as a thank 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 note i am extremely happy to be here where uh, there are four generations professor manchanda sir who was teacher of ssk kotari sir uh, kotari sir who is my teacher and i am happy to be there along with my one of my good students dr falgun 
So it's an amalgamation of four generations. I'm happy to be the, here, sir. Thank you. <laughs> you more like India. You see, we are joint family. So, so you've forgotten the interim generations like KK, me, and all that. But anyway. <laughs> so, but that's okay. That's his perspective. We, 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 we that as it may, I think all good things have to come to an end. But I think I'll be failing in my duty uh, if I don't thank everybody. I mean, everyone is contributed. We have forgotten to mention Dr. Murli Dharan, who actually uh, also actively participated in this. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Manchanda. You stayed for such a long time. So thank you all. And One last word from Dr. Manchanda. Yeah. Of course. Well, it was an interesting case. <clears throat> but as you said, I think the lesson is that any postgraduate, if he sees a patient of hypertension, especially elderly, uncontrolled, should record the blood pressure both in the upper and lower limbs. It's as simple as that. You know, atherosclerosis can occur in the renal arteries, but if they are um, not there, it can occur in the aorta. We know it very well. Of course, this is a coral reef, which is a very rare condition. Uh, it can, but I think that's the lesson one should learn. So I think complete physical examination is important. We ask uh, uh, all these students to at least check blood pressure in the lower limb once. It can be missed, you know that, especially obese, if you move, may be delayed. But very interesting case. I think I enjoyed it thoroughly, and the discussion was really great. Congratulations to each one of you, Dr. Kothari and all of you. Thank you, Sruti. Can you show the last three slides, which I'll just quickly, um, this is just to tell you that we look forward to the entire group joining us again. And we have a different flavor. We'll have the first journal club. We have an in-depth discussion on the ischemia trial. Uh, and we have the investigators of the ischemia trial uh, participate in this discussion. So some of the people will give you first-hand information uh, on this study that is very important and very integral to our practice, which is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the journal club, uh, the, paper, the journal article will be shared with all the registrants of the master class. Um, the next slide. Uh, we've also downstream planned uh, two sessions based on you know, feedback from a uh, lot of students. One is a first year orientation session on thesis development and some basic procedures that you know you need to be familiar with, like a temporary pacemaker, uh, central line insertion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we will have one such session downstream and we will also have a one day exam session, but we'll do it in a manner that you, you, you can really feel, uh, acquire a much higher level of confidence. Again, there are no shortcuts for an exam. That's just going to add the final polish. At the end of the day, you have to go through the hard grind of understanding your subject. And finally, um, next slide, that's it. Oh, yeah. So, I would like you to submit your uh, post-test feedback, uh, which you know you will participate in the website in your respective uh, dashboards. And I really have to thank everyone. I mean, it's a long list of people I have to thank, but I quickly will say the entire PHFI team that put this together. Without question, this the stars of today's show are Dr. Uh, Manoj and Dr. Bhupati. I think without this, we couldn't have had this phenomenal case. Terrific performance from Falgun. Thank you, the student panel. Thank you for uh, participating. Dr. Kothari was masterful as always. I mean, uh, without this, we couldn't have really had the kind of engagement that we had. Dr. Srinivas, your inputs were valuable. Dr. Sarita, terrific to have joined you, for you to have joined this. And everybody else in this program. And of course, I must thank uh, Sun Pharma for their support for this program through their un unrestricted educational grant. Thank you all. Thank you to a number of cardiology colleagues all over the country who have supported this venture and by having their students join this program. Thank you. So thank you and have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So do we wait for any deep brief or we disconnect? We can wait for a minute, sir. The HFI team can wait for a minute. Sure. sure. Thank you. Katie has disconnected, I think. Yes, yeah, so, so we can we can probably join on another another Zoom. Okay. okay. Or should we should do it? It's too late, man. Now we'll do it tomorrow or Monday. Or right, we'll do it. You want to do it now? So five ten minutes, sir, if okay, possible. I'm just calling on us. Priyanka, can you uh, share another link to all of us? Yeah, sure, please. Okay. Yeah, we just need five minutes. Yeah.